my pillow I can't close these eyes at night When you think of blind musicians, Roy Orbison comes to mind, or Stevie Wonder, even Canada's own Jeff Healy. But there's another Canadian who's starting to make a name for himself, Ottawa-based Lucas Hanneman. I'm singing to the distance every time you say you've got to leave. That's the truth. The musical history of Lucas Hanneman. When I was young, I really was obsessed with music, and that has stuck with me to this day. I'm not a player who holds back. I, I go for things sometimes if they're a little bit beyond my capability. <laughs> Somehow I end up at the finish line, you know, scrapes and bruises and all. Lucas is always pushing his guitar playing boundaries, and he doesn't shy away from difficult styles of music or even instruments. Take, for example, the eight-string fan fret guitar made by Ottawa guitar builder Pat Hawley. It's a really cool guitar. Uh, it's really unique. It's something I dreamt up, and, and he made it a reality, so that's very cool. I could devote a whole career to trying to just play this guitar as well as I possibly could. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's really a, a, like a one-of-a-kind beast, and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a really special instrument for sure. The other thing that I think perhaps makes me a little unique is that I, I focus equally on playing acoustic guitar and electric guitar. Uh, I've done a lot of both, and um, I certainly uh, I feel lucky that I've I've worked hard enough on both that I I, kind of, I think I've developed a sound on on both the acoustic guitar and the electric guitar. Lucas easily makes the switch to his electric guitar as his band starts rehearsing for an upcoming gig. It's taken him a long time to find his own style and voice, but he's finally found it in the four-piece blues ensemble he friends called the Lucas Hanneman Express. Rounding out Lucas's prolific guitar and songwriting skills are his wife, Megan Lawrence, who's a powerful blues and country singer. I think I always knew that I wanted to do something in the way of performing and I just have been extremely blessed to be able to do that and then meet somebody who was like-minded. Then there's their steady and reliable bassist, Martin Newman. It's like a bit like flying a kite where somebody's got to hold the string. If you let go of the string, it, it, you know, it doesn't work anymore. So. I, I'm the one holding it down a lot of the time so that the kite will fly. You know? <laughs> and their versatile drummer, Valerie or Val Nagavara, who is new to the band and to Canada after immigrating from Ukraine. It's really, really great, great music and great uh, songs. Any type of music, beautiful if people love it and do it with heart. Lucas's ability to keep pushing his own limits can be traced back to the fact that he's never let a visual impairment stop him from doing anything. I don't really feel that having a visual impairment holds you back from being a guitar player. To me, my visual impairment actually gives me an upper hand uh, as a musician. I truly feel that if you use your ears, I mean, after all, it is music, right, so that we're talking about. So if you use your ears as much as you possibly can to learn how to play an instrument, you're actually probably going to learn a little bit faster and have a bit of a deeper connection with your instrument. For the styles of music that I focus on, which are more blues and roots-based music, uh, funk, a little bit of jazz, things like that, um, certainly using your ears is actually helpful. Lucas was born prematurely and without most of his vision after his mother's appendix burst when she was only six and a half months pregnant. My vision is what they call... Uh, retinal detachment due to premature birth or 
there's some official term for it that I don't know, which I should know, but uh, I guess that shows how much I care about it. But like, yeah, basically I, um, I have no vision at all in my left eye. I have a fully detached retina there. And then in my, in my right eye, it's about 8% vision. The first few months of Lucas's life were touch and go. Apparently I only had a 40% chance of living. Basically I was in an incubator for the first six months of my, my life. I was a tiny baby, um, so I'm grateful to be here now, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be alive, that's for sure, you know, I mean, sight or no sight, I don't really care about that, it's just that I'm, I'm lucky to, to be here. After six months in the hospital, he was finally able to go home to his parents and his brother, who was adopted less than a year before Lucas was born. As he went from being an underweight, premature baby to a thriving, curious toddler, Lucas quickly turned his attention to his life's greatest passion. I've got a picture of, of me trying to reach over my father's guitar. My father has this big, big old acoustic guitar. Uh, and uh, from when, you know, from basically the point where I could probably not even quite walk, I wanted to play his guitar. Um, so I was, I was obsessed with the, with the instrument from a very young age. Early on, the adults in Lucas's life pushed him to play by ear and to be as independent as possible. The sooner that I started really using my ears, uh, the better it was for me. And I had a lot of people encouraging me to do that. My parents were extremely encouraging of, of me being independent as well. Like they let me ride a bike when I was a kid, which isn't something I'd recommend. Throughout his formative years, Lucas took any chance he could get to perform, whether that was in talent shows, his high school concert band, or rock bands with friends. After high school, even though his musical style was all over the map, he decided to study jazz at Concordia University. I wanted to keep doing what I was doing, musically speaking, like all these different styles, but have, you know, be, be certainly influenced by what I was studying at school. And, and I had heard great things about Concordia being a good school for that, and it certainly was. I, I learned a lot at Concordia, but I also kept playing uh, blues and funk and all these other styles of music. So peace called Good Beginning. Despite the fact that he was now studying jazz full time and juggling his regular course load, Lucas continued gigging with multiple bands and playing different styles of music. In university, at one point, I had three weekly gigs. Like I, I was, I was actually doing almost too much. From a young age, I was always doing this. Like I've never had another job. I'm very lucky. After university, Lucas kept up this hectic pace and released a solo jazz album. 2011's This Is What's Up, but it wasn't until three years later that his career really started to take off. That's the Truth returns in a moment. That's the Truth. The musical history of Lucas Hanneman is back. <laughs> After releasing his jazz album in 2011, Lucas spent the next three years bouncing from band to band to band. Then, in 2014, feeling like his musical style was out of control, Lucas decided to start his own band. I kind of tried to play everything when I was younger and definitely into my mid-twenties. I tried to play every style of music I possibly could. And then eventually I kind of said, okay, I've had enough. I've got to just focus on one thing and really try to do it the best I can, which is my, my band, the Lucas Hanneman Express. And that's, it's definitely a blues band, but it certainly draws on those other influences as well. We don't have to fight. Cause the original band consisted of Lucas on guitar, Martin Newman on bass, and drummer Jeff Asselin. Their first album, Welcome Aboard, was released in 2015 and featured Megan on backup vocals. Welcome Aboard was certainly a more focused effort than my own solo album that I did in 2011, uh, but it still wasn't quite focused enough. In 2016, the band, which now officially included Megan, entered the Ottawa Blues Competition, The Road to Memphis. And we won it uh, somehow, somehow, not being a very traditional blues band. But uh, so we managed to kind of squeak through the cracks and, and then we made it down to Memphis. When I get up, I start my day. A cup of coffee and I'm on the way. It was while the band was in Memphis that an unexpected opportunity came up, which would lead to the creation of the Express's sophomore album. We started recording the album at Sun Studios, which is a legendary studio where Johnny Cash did his first hits, 
Uh, Elvis did his first hits. B.B. Yes, King so. recorded there. We had a list of tourist things to do, and the first uh, thing we did was visit Sun Studio. And uh, while we were there, we found out uh, they still use, run it as a studio. It's not just a museum, and you can book time. And so then Jeff, our original drummer, came over and he said, guys, like, if we pool our money together, why don't we come and do this or try? Yeah, we kind of talked about it briefly and, you know, uh, felt in our pockets. And <laughs> like, okay, it's going to, obviously, it costs money, and we, so we had to come up with money. But, uh, yeah, we pretty quickly we decided, yeah, let's, let's do that. That would be... Uh, a very cool way to start the, the new album. And it was last minute notice, uh, we got in touch, we, we sent a message to the to Curry Weber, who was the, the recording engineer there, and he said, you know what, I wouldn't normally do this on, on short notice, but I listened to some of your stuff and I really liked it. The band managed to grab a spot in the Fame studio on their last night in Memphis. It's a, a wild place. And then they have all these X's on the floor where it's like, oh yeah, like this is approximately where Sam Phillips, who was the producer back then, had, uh, you know, Roy Orbison's stand or B.B. King's stand or whatever when they were doing their vocal takes. It's just like, <laughs> it's crazy. So we did everything like live off the floor, uh, which means that we were all playing at the same time, which isn't, which isn't unfortunately always the case these days with, with uh, the way bands record. So we did it like the old school way. They recorded three songs and stayed in the studio until two in the morning. Sweet. <laughs> and then we woke up the next day, flew home, and uh, we had these these uh, recordings that we mixed in Ottawa and that became part of that Tearing Up the Rails album. Yeah, it definitely set the tone for the album, and that was a pretty special thing. Released at the end of 2016, Tearing Up the Rails was a more focused effort and brought about Lucas's favorite moment of all time. Actually, make that one of his favorite moments of all time. We had the chance to open for the Dave Matthews Band at Blues Fest, which is, for me, was like the best moment of my life. Almost, well, okay, getting married was the best moment of my life, but 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 this and and my daughter's birth. But but this was right up there. Thank you so much, guys. You guys looking forward to Spencer Lee and Dave Matthews Band? I know I am. Oh yeah. This next one's gonna feature Megan Lawrence. We're gonna take it down, slow blues called That's the Truth. One of the songs from the album called That's the Truth proves that the inspiration for a song can come from unexpected places. That's the Truth is a song that I wrote during a period of frustration when we were having some renovations done in our house where uh, I found that this person who was renovating our house was, God, he's always at, at the neighbor's houses doing work on their houses and so like we're waiting and stuff like that and Megan was like, well write the song about cheating because he's cheating on us with our neighbors, you know, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. You say you'll be the baby, all you do is cheat well. The album Tearing Up the Rails helped the band increase their exposure, bringing them more fans and more recognition. By 2018, the band was back in the studio to record their third album, Catch the Westbound, which turned out to be much darker than the others. Every morning at 7 a.m., make some breakfast and she pampers him. And I was also really inf influenced at that time by uh, like old blues, like pre 12 bar blues, really old school stuff, and uh, like the murder ballad tradition, which again is like the, the Catch the Westbound album has a lot of dark <laughs> subject matter on it. Here there's a song called Devils in My Grave, which is kind of our, our magnum opus, so to speak. It's like a, it's a big, long song, but it's, it's to me, in terms of the lyric and the depth of the, of the writing, um, that's a song I'm very happy with. It's basically about a man who drinks the devil's potion, so to speak, and ends up having conversations in the afterlife with the devil. It's a very dark kind of thing. So far, audiences are responding well to the new record. We made it up to five, the top five on the on the Canadian Music re Report uh, chart. So it was kind of surreal, you know, seeing our name um, above like Alicia Cara. I, 
I'd say it has a bit more commercial appeal. And like one thing I say about that, that album is it's kind of blues for people who don't like blues. <laughs> That's the truth returns in a moment. That's the truth. The musical history of Lucas Hanneman is back. All right. Headphones on. You need those to start. Okay, here we go. Because of his visual impairment, Lucas can't physically write music. So Lucas writes music in his own way. Today he's working on a song for the next album called When I'm With Her. It's kind of a weird process because I can't write music, like physically I can't write it. Um, it's, it. It's easier for me just to make demos and then show those demos to the band, rough ideas of their parts, and then they'll make it infinitely better. Lucas is able to write this way because of his vast musical abilities. Not only does he play guitar, he also sings and plays bass and the mandolin. He even plays a pretty mean set of drums. Usually I'll start uh, with some kind of a hook, some kind of a melody beat on the guitar or a vocal idea. I'll record that into my phone. And then what I'll do is I'll go to my soundproof room in my, in my house uh, where the drum set is and I'll record. I'll basically think about the whole form of the song. Now it's like you want to write something that's going to really grab people right away. So. Yeah, that can start with a guitar hook, it can start with a vocal line, or it can start with, in my, my case, a, like a drum groove as well. So we got this groove. Oh, maybe. Yeah. That's bluesy, I like that. Once all the tracks are recorded, Lucas listens to each of the tracks on the computer before putting them together in a rough demo. I'm a very odd person when it comes to songwriting. Um, my wife will attest to that. Uh, like sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll, I'll literally have to take my iPhone and go downstairs to the basement and flesh something out and then I'll come back to bed or whatever. And it's crazy, like I'm sure I drive Megan nuts sometimes. After receiving their demos from Lucas a few days ago, the band is now ready to work on the song together. Yeah, he sends us recordings of his ideas of what our parts would be like, but uh, you know, we bring our interpretation to it. Guitar is what he does, but he's one of those people who can kind of pick up any instrument and make it work. I can't play like exactly like Lucas. I try to play like my way and Lucas said, oh yeah, it's good or it's not good. And we, we just decide on a rehearsal what we will do. So you guys got the, uh, the track uh, for when I'm with her? Yeah, you guys, you wrote the chart there, Val? You got yeah, your, yeah, yeah. yeah, cool. Every second time through it goes down. So, you know, C, B flat, then to A, A flat. And then I, I go up to B, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, B flat, I should say. Yeah, and then back up to this, Ribbon, yeah. yeah. So it goes like... Lucas knows what he wants, and, uh, and he knows that we can give him what he wants, too. He's looking for our sound and our approach. Yeah, that's great. That sounds awesome, guys. Yeah, yeah. you guys did your homework. When we come to rehearse, we have a few ideas, which uh, we try to realize in the music. If it's work, Lucas say, oh, good, <laughs> or something, oh, we need to change something. Okay, and yeah. some ideas can come from bass, from drums. It's about music, not about work. <laughs> Yeah, let's play that intro part. Uh, okay. One, two, one, two, three, four. Once the band has the gist of their parts figured out, it's time to add Megan's sultry vocals to the mix. Should we give it a try, guys? Well. Yeah. One, two, three. Drop your fears in the river, watch them crash like waves do. Cleanse your soul and 
shiver, let that love wash over you. He's got that energy that he's always going for something, something more, something. He's always reaching for something that, you know, is he going to make it? Is he going to pull this off? Uh, you know, but, uh, so he's a really exciting kind of player to listen to. Yeah. yeah. So you do the... Yeah, exactly. But there's no uh, band drama, you know? Like, it's not ego stuff. I mean, it, it's very easygoing. It's very much about the music and putting that music first, which is something that I always wanted when I was young. But it just takes a long time to find it sometimes, and I'm so happy I did. You feel I can fly. You know that I can touch the sky. When I kiss her, oh, oh, let me stay with her. When I'm with her, I feel like it died. And tell the world that I was satisfied. Can't resist her. When I kiss her, let me stay with her. I think we're getting somewhere with that, guys. It feels, it feels pretty good. All right, what are we it feels do good. That's the truth. Returns in a moment. The musical history of Lucas Hanneman is back. Well, the Lucas Hanneman Express has been geeking like crazy and growing in popularity for the past six years. Their top five result on the Roots Music Report Canadian album chart can attest to that. Recently, Lucas and Megan decided to start a new venture. Megan and I went down to Memphis, Tennessee again for the International Blues Challenge, but this time it was in a different category. It's what they call the, the solo duo category. And we were lucky. We were one of only two Canadian acts to make the semifinals, so we did really, really well. I take my acoustic guitar out. It's a very different vibe than the full band, and Megan and I do our, our duo thing, which is a, a different can of worms. For Megan, getting on stage with Lucas and the Express has given her a second chance at a career that was almost ended by a very nasty side of the music industry, body shaming. For the beginning part of my career, uh, which would be around the age of 11 to 16, I did a lot of performing. And so I was in lots of competitions and I, had, I was on television at one point for a a program that was on CTV called Homegrown Cafe. And I was on Canadian Idol at one point, and I did all of those things. But my entire career leading up to that point kind of stalled out when I was about 18 because I kept being told that I was too fat to be on <laughs> television. Producers would say, if I didn't have to see you, you sound amazing. And I'd be like, thank you? <laughs> like, I don't know how to take that, but thank you. And my parents were like, she's a teenager. Like, we don't need her having body image and everything else. So I kind of stopped at that point because I believed it. And that's the hard part is that eventually when you keep hearing you're fat, you don't look good. You begin to take that on and you begin to think, yeah, there's really no point. And I did let it creep in for a little bit. Once the self-doubt set in, Megan's performing career was put on hold. It wasn't until Lucas entered her life in 2014 that she started performing regularly again. It was kind of nice because when I met Lucas, he just fell in love with the voice. First, Lucas and I refused to work together <laughs> because of the fact that I didn't want people to think that I started dating him because he was Lucas Hanneman and he could play guitar and that could be a good way for me to get back in. And so we had agreed never to play together. And then we were getting offered gigs separately where we'd have to pay somebody else, <laughs> say like $250. And we were like, well, if we want to get married and we want a house, maybe this is foolish and we should just start working together. 
Hey everybody, my name is Lucas Hanneman, this is Megan Lawrence. Glad, we're, we're very glad to be back here at the Brook Street Hotel. Thank you so much. It's a lot of fun because when you hear the duo versus the band, it's amazing how the material works in both concepts. Much like their career as a musical duo, Lucas and Megan's relationship almost didn't happen as well. I met him six years ago. It was a jazz gig in, of all places, a pub in Canada, Ontario. Oh, 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 oh. He was just really nice and he was cueing me because he knew that I was slightly nervous because I don't do a lot of jazz gigs. I'm a country singer and a blues <laughs> singer. Oh, yeah, yeah. I knew you, you knew me. Everything was fancy free till you left me there for day. Let these go scarlet. I noticed that Megan had a tremendous voice. And I want to and was an extremely be beautiful person on top of all of that. And um, uh, so we kind of hit it off, uh, although she was there with a friend of hers who I was convinced was her boyfriend. He thought I was with my going out with my best friend, <laughs> who I wasn't. And at the end of the gig, we're talking, and uh, he was really, really nice, but he said he had a girlfriend when he was talking. He was like, my girlfriend and I like to listen to vinyl. And so my friend went, ooh. He's in a relationship. And I went, oh, he's in a relationship. Well, when I go walking, I move real fast. And I crush everything that blocks my path. It might be grassy, it may have arms. But I don't see it, so I haven't done no harm. Well, I tried. Apparently, I made it seem like I had a girlfriend, even though I didn't at the time. Um, so it was like this big mis miscommunication. The two later ran into each other at various local events. She'll claim that I blew her off for the first couple times we saw each other after that. I had already kind of run into him a couple more times in between there, and he had technically blown me off, <laughs> where he walked by me and I was like, hey, Lucas, and he just kept going. <laughs> I didn't mean to, that's for sure. Ooh, if we get hitched. We'll be bound. I mean, I, he is visually impaired, so yes, he always says, I didn't know you were there. And I'm like, I guess I have to take that as the truth. Oh, no, I think we're talking, but I'm talking to myself. No, 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 why am I talking to myself? In the end, it was up to Megan's friend Jenner to play matchmaker. Not only did he convince Megan to take one last chance on Lucas, he also made it explicitly clear that they were not a couple. Now, something that my friend has never done in his entire life is he starts telling Lucas that he's gay and everything. Now, my friend doesn't usually tell people this, but he wanted him to know, look, we are not together. She is totally single and then tells him I'm single. And I was like, oh, OK. Like, and they, they, they were like best friends. And I was like, OK, this is awesome. You left me high in trap, baby. I don't lie, that's the truth. Always want me home early. Well, I never have my fun. No, I remember we went to this party and it was like no one else existed. And so. As I was driving him home, I went, this is now or never. And I was like, do you want to grab coffee? And he said, sure. So we went out for coffee and, uh, you know, drank coffee until the sun rose. And then I think the next week we, we went out uh, on our first official date. And we had a 16 hour date that closed down two restaurants and then stayed at the Tim Hortons. <laughs> and that was it. You left me high and drop a it was just one of those one of those situations where we just fell in love deeply very quickly and she's an absolutely incredible person. It was nice, but it almost didn't happen because if it hadn't been for Jenner, we would have just missed each other. So thank God for him. Long story short, that guy, uh, his name's Jenner, he actually ended up uh, getting his officiant uh, license online and ended up marrying us when we got married. That's the truth, baby. That's Megan Lawrence, everybody. Thank you. That's the truth returns in a moment.
That's the truth. The musical history of Lucas Hanneman is back. Since picking up the instrument as a toddler, Lucas has amassed quite the collection of guitars. I love all kinds of guitars. I have everything from like very cheap kind of import guitars that sound great uh, to all the way up to handmade guitars. With his collection already numbering 14, at this point, picking a favorite would be impossible. I could tell you my top four instruments that I own, but I, I can't tell you one guitar. I can't, I just can't. I can't tell you one guitar that I love the most. I just can't. <laughs> Uh, it's too hard. They're like children. <laughs> you have to love them all. This is a bit of our R2 and Cold Cold Front. My husband's a musician first and foremost. And that is the joke that we always tell each other is that um, he loves his guitars. And then it's us. <laughs> And he'll, he'll go, no, it's not. I swear to God, it's you. But the funny part is, is that the last time we were in Memphis, the fire alarm went off. Now my husband grabs his guitar, the drummer grabs his sticks and cymbals, and the two of them run out of the Airbnb. And he leaves me behind. And then the big joke is everyone always goes, so Lucas, the next time, are you gonna grab the guitar or your wife? And he goes, well, and they're like, no, there's no well. He's like, no, 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 I'm gonna grab the guitar. She'll grab Kensley and we'll go together this time. <laughs> and I laugh about it because of the fact that I understand as a musician <laughs> where that is. It's fine. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything bad. It doesn't, I'm the, I'm the human person that he loves first <laughs> along with Kensley, but the guitar does take the presidents, and that's all right. Two of Lucas's handmade guitars, including a smaller 12-string soprano guitar, were made by a guitar builder based out of Elmont, Ontario. I met Peggy White at the gig of a local fantastic musician named Terry Tufts. I was asking around, I said, what's that guitar that Terry's playing? It sounds so good. And someone walked over and uh, they found out that not only was it a Peggy White guitar, but Peggy was also in the audience that, that day to watch Terry play. Both the guitars that Peggy made for me, the wood that she used is just out of this world. They're just breathtaking instruments. They're, Peggy really has her own aesthetic quality in her guitars. She makes absolutely gorgeous instruments, and you know I think that's, uh, that's saying something about her personality and, and her as a person. <laughs> Peggy White has been building guitars in her studio in Elmont since 2017. Although she's a talented musician in her own right, it was a personal tragedy that made her decide to pursue the craft. Nine years ago, I lost my oldest son in a snowmobile accident. He was 18. And after that, I really took a step back and started looking at my life and what I was doing. and. How did I want to move forward? What did I want to give to the world, but what did I want to give myself? And this was something I'd always wanted to do, so I took the plunge at 51 years old. I think losing my son, this might sound weird, but it gave me courage to, to really step into what I wanted to do and, and make that decision to, to do something at that age where Probably if, if I hadn't lost him, I certainly wouldn't have had the courage to do it. Her first step was signing up for Sergei D. Young's five-week course in Chelsea, Quebec. Although Peggy had been a musician all her life, when it came to guitar building, she was a complete beginner. So not only did I decide I was going to build guitars, but I had never done any woodworking. So I had to learn how to run the machines. And that, I think that for me was the scariest part was especially the table saw, I didn't go near it for, I don't think I went near it during the course. And the band saw, I was scared of all the machines. After building a full guitar and starting a second in Sergei's course, Peggy continued her education, apprenticing under world-renowned guitar builders, Linda Manzer and Michelle Pellerin. From Linda, I went on to apprentice with Michelle Pellerin out of uh, Thetford Mines, Quebec. And that was where I really honed my building style and my sound. And 
really gained the confidence then to leave him and come back to Elmont and open up my first shop, which was August 2017. For Peggy, guitar building has become all-consuming. I've always had that passion for wood, and I've always had the passion for music, so it was sort of a perfect marriage. I'm thinking about building pretty much 24-7, and that when I started building, I, I literally could not sleep at night. I was so excited, I couldn't wait to wake up and go, go to work, which is great. Having experience as a musician, both as a singer-songwriter and backup musician, has definitely helped Peggy hone her skills. I personally think it's really important that, that you are a player, because I don't know how you would figure out the feel and the sound and things like that that are so important if you're not a player. With over 200 hours of work going into each guitar, seeing musicians like Lucas play her creations make the long hours and dedication to her craft worth it. I have so many favorite players. Girl, you blew my voice. And a lot of them are playing my guitars. <laughs> So Lucas is absolutely at the top of the list. I'm singing to the distance every time you say you've got to leave. Because of Lucas's unique playing style, building guitars for him posed some unique challenges. You can't label him. There's no style. He plays blues. Uh, he sent me a recording of this beautiful finger style. I didn't even know he could play like that. Um, I've heard him play country. I've heard him play Middle Eastern style. He'll, he can play anything. He's so diverse. So the challenge for me was Lucas is such a diverse player that he'll go from playing really light to just wailing on the guitar. I thought, oh, okay. So I have to build something that's going to be really responsive when he's playing lightly, but be able to handle him really digging into it. It means everything. Just show me everything. I can't think of anything that would bring me more joy than building guitars. It's a great guitar. My son is in every guitar I make. That's the Truth returns in a moment. That's the Truth. The musical history of Lucas Hanneman is back. When you finally decide that you've run out of air, let the note go, and then I'll tell you how long you've held it for. Okay. Most okay. musicians can't make a living off of performing alone. They have to supplement their careers with other sources of income. So Lucas and Megan still teach to help pay the bills. But since music is such a passion for them, it's a job they love doing. Uh, <laughs> Did I okay, that I was 16. Oh, okay. okay. So you just added three seconds there. Okay. okay. So you know what you have to do. While Megan okay. gives voice lessons, yeah, Lucas teaches 16-year-old guitarist Kieran Carson. That you could you could you know solo yeah. in A minor, right? He's just a really talented guy, and it, 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 he's one of those students where I feel like the more I throw at him, the more he throws back, you know. And in terms of his development, and, and it's just amazing to see that. I've been teaching guitar students since I was about 16. It's great. Like I love I love helping people grow. You know, one thing I'd like to hear you try to implement a bit more is is more of the triplets. Yeah. I, I've really built it up now, where I guess I have a about somewhere like 20 something, 20 something students a week, which is enough for me. And I cram them all into three days a week because I, 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 I like to leave um, my Mondays, my Fridays, my weekends free for, for gigs and for, for the band stuff and for recording and for traveling. That's great, you know, that's awesome, Karen. And then, yeah, because it just, it brings up the potential for interaction a bit right. more when you throw that into your improvising, yep. right? Well, for me as a visually impaired person, um, I think I bring to my students a certain awareness of sound and a certain dependence on one's ears and developing one's ears. Nice. Cool. 
<laughs> Good job. The little downtime that Megan and Lucas do have is focused on their two-year-old daughter, Kensley. <gasps> Oh, you're helping daddy. Oh. Sometimes I just pinch myself because I, if I'm being totally honest, I never thought I would have a family. I'm making some kind of a spaceship or something. Do you want to help me make my spaceship? It's just completely opened up my heart in a, in a, in a new way. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I love about having kids is that it kind of can bring you back to your childhood. Okay. Okay. Or I don't want to. Do you want these two pieces? One of the most heartfelt songs off the Catch the Westbound album is To Be Brave, which was written just for Kinsley. It's a song about being brave enough to follow your dreams. You can't wait till the stars align. You can't wait for the phone to ring. The blues come whether you're a fool or king. When I was young, I used to draw. Uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and, and I used to draw pictures of how I pictured myself when I was 25, you know, uh, and uh, I always had a guitar in my hand. I'm really fortunate, and so is my wife Megan, uh, that we both knew from a very young age exactly what we wanted to do. The morning comes, the brand new dawn, I'm so, so wild. We're going to keep on keeping on uh, where, yeah, where it might go. It's hard to say it. I'm not going to get rich and famous, but uh, that's not why we do it now. You do it because you need to do it, and we're going to keep on doing it. We're very lucky that this is our life and that we get to do this with the people we love. For now, the Lucas Hanneman Express is going to continue working hard and doing what they love. I'm not someone who ever gets stagnant. I am someone who's always looking towards the next thing, and I'm never really satisfied with where I'm at. I definitely am not yet where I want to be. Now's the time, baby, to be brave. With four albums under his belt, and at least two more in the works, Lucas knows firsthand that having a visual impairment doesn't have to hold you back from doing what you love in life. I would tell parents who have um, a blind child that's an infant, um, I would say it's going to be okay. This fake tattoo lets you know everything in life is unrevolving. We all find our, our own ways to, to do what we want to do in life. It's just that if we have a quote-unquote disability, we, we might do it differently. Um, so the biggest thing for parents who have a, a disabled child of any kind would be let that child be independent. Force yourself to let that child follow their dreams. Um, and also let that child explore the world and be creative because you never know what someone will be uh, and, and you never know what they will have the chance to become. It means everything. Produced and directed by Tim Alp. Writer and story editor, Maureen Carter. Additional writing, Tim Alp. Narrator, Alan Cross. Director of photography, Stefan Shemansky. Camera operator, Tim Alp. Production manager, Gail Nakamoto. Production assistant, Mason Alp. Location audio, Frederick Edwards. Editor, Tracy Bacinas. Assistant editor, Riley Alp. Junior editor, Mason Alp. Video footage courtesy of Darcy DeToni, RBC Ottawa Blues Fest, Neville Carney, and Wayne Hanneman. Photographs courtesy of Wayne and Darcy Hanneman and Neville Carney. Integrated Described Video Specialist M. Williams. Regional Content Specialist Karen McGee. Coordinating Producer Jennifer Johnson. Director of Production Karen Nye. Director of Programming Brian Perdue. VP Programming and Production John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Produced by Mountain Road Productions. Copyright 2020 Accessible Media Inc.